Hey, in today's video I would like to walk you through how we managed to dump the internal firmware of the Nintendo Game & Watch using a relatively simple exploit and only a few lines of assembly. But before we do so, I also want to give a short update on what happened in the Game & Watch hacking community in the last few weeks, because it's been pretty amazing to watch and be a part of it. Now, as you probably know, roughly two weeks ago we released the tools that allow anyone with basic hardware hacking skills and decent knowledge of software development to back up the firmware of the device. We also released resources for developing and flashing custom homebrew for the Game & Watch. And we've seen some pretty awesome things come from the community. One of the big achievements is that we now have reverse engineered the entire hardware. Jake Little, also known as Upcycle Electronics, traced every last connection on the device and made a great overview showing exactly which trace goes where and how everything is connected. He even created a full schematic in KiCad. Great work. A big help was also the fact that two Daniels, Daniel Padilla and my good friend Daniel Cuthbert, both provided high-resolution X-ray images of the PCB. This allowed us to see all the hidden layers and made reverse engineering much easier, especially with the BGA components that don't allow for easy probing. Furthermore, we now have a complete list of types and datasheets for all important components, except for the display, which seems to be custom. But as it's fully working, this is not a problem. Sander van der Vel, in the meantime, even designed a custom 3D printed backside for the Game & Watch, which gives room for an easily accessible debug connector, without having to modify the original backside. The files are available on Thingiverse, and so if you have a 3D printer, you can easily print your own. Also on the hardware side, DNA64, Conrad Backman, who I hope you are following on Twitter and YouTube by now, and me have replaced the original flash chip, which only has 1 MB of storage, with a larger 16 MB one. And we found that the Macronix MX25U12835 is both compatible with the stock firmware while also being fast and easily usable for homebrew development. These flash chips cost less than $3 and are really worth the investment. Though note that to put it in, you will need some experience in reworking PCBs and equipment such as a hot air soldering gun. There's also a project that aims to build a custom motherboard for the Game & Watch, with an FPGA instead of a microcontroller. This would be pretty awesome as it would allow cycle exact emulation of processors and would also otherwise be awesome for experimentation. Others are planning to build a PCB with an ESP32 on it, which would give you a fast processor with Wi-Fi and Bluetooth capabilities. Now let's talk about software, which also has seen some great progress. On the NES and Game Boy emulator side, we now have standby support. So when you press the power button, your current game state will be safe to flash and resume when you turn the device back on. As we are storing to flash, this also means that your game is saved even when your battery runs out. Conrad also implemented different screen interpolation methods, so that now all games run in full screen, and during compilation you can set different interpolation methods. In the future we will make this configurable in the on-screen menu. Speaking of on-screen menu, Conrad and me started working on a ROM chooser menu based on the original RetroGo code, which now allows you to select different games when turning on the device. This is quite far from being finished, but we are doing our best to get it fully working. If you want to support our efforts, there is also now a Patreon where you can support us and will also allow you to join some Patreon-only Discord channels, and even allow you to vote on some future video content. Another awesome project comes from Alfonso Luna. He ported a Chip8 emulator to the Game & Watch, which comes with a couple of arcade-ish games such as Snake, Flight Runner, and so on. Pretty fun, and you can also add your own Chip8 ROMs. Then Cyanic came around, and he actually built a binary patch for the original firmware that fixes the language bug that the device ships with. So he is basically providing patches for an officially non-updatable device. I also know that there's a lot of other software in the works, such as an emulator for the original Game & Watch games, and so I'm pretty excited to see what else will get released soon. We have also received a ton of patches for the different scripts we published, and have a great support community on Discord that helps new developers getting on board. We are also in the process of creating detailed instructions on how to use different debug adapters to backup and flash the Game & Watch, and Dean Huffman even already created a guide on how to exactly use an STM32 nuclear board to hack the Game & Watch. I'm also excited that a talk about the Game & Watch has been accepted to this year's Chaos Computer Club Remote Congress, the RC3, so stay tuned for that. Now let's talk about how we actually managed to dump the original firmware of the Nintendo Game & Watch. After I teamed up with Conrad, we immediately started discussing how we can potentially access the internal firmware. As a reminder, the STM32 processor in the Game & Watch is set to readout protection level 1, which allows us to read the RAM via the debug port, but prevents us from reading the STM32 internal flash. Now we started digging around a bit, and while looking through the reference manual of the STM32, I noticed that it has a special RAM called ITCM RAM, 
which is a tightly coupled RAM that is super fast to access and is primarily designed to be used to hold code that gets called very often and is performance critical. And I realized that I never actually looked at the contents of that RAM area. And so I dumped it from the device and found that it contains ARM code. Now, what if this ARM code is loaded from the encrypted external flash in the same way the ROM was loaded in the first video? And so just like in the first video, I put zeros at the very beginning of the spy flash data and checked whether the contents of this ITCM RAM area changed. And it did. Turns out that address zero of the spy flash is loaded directly into the ITCM RAM of the STM32. And so just like in the first video, we can XOR the ITCM RAM data with the contents of the encrypted external flash to get the XOR stream that was used for the encryption. This then allows us to encrypt our own code that will be loaded into the ITCM RAM area. Now a big problem is, we don't know which code of this ITCM RAM area will be executed. Like we don't know whether the firmware will jump to address zero, address 200 or whatever. But there's a simple solution. We can use something called a knob slide. A knob or no operation is an instruction that simply does nothing. It's often used to ensure a certain number of CPU cycles have passed, but in our case we can basically fill the ITCM RAM with knob instructions and put our payload at the very end. This creates a slide of knobs and wherever the firmware jumps to it will just start executing knobs, basically sliding down the knobs into our payload. Speaking about the payload, Conrad wrote a simple payload that just reads from the internal flash and copies its contents into RAM and then just goes into an endless loop. This just takes 10 instructions and so we can have a pretty long knob slide with a very short payload. And this is exactly what our backup scripts do. We use OpenOCD to dump the contents of the ITCM, which, because it's RAM, is readable even though the device is running in read protection level 1. And then we copy a piece of code to RAM called Flash Dumper, which copies the contents of the external spy flash into RAM. Then we dump those RAM contents using OpenOCD which gives us the encrypted spy flash contents. Using the external flash contents and the ITCM contents, we can encrypt our own payload. Next, we copy another small tool called Flash Loader to RAM, which writes our encrypted payload into the external flash. When we reboot the device now, the firmware will decrypt our payload and copy it into ITCM RAM. As soon as our payload gets called, we get a copy of the STM32's internal flash in RAM which we then can dump using the debugger. And now we have a full backup of the device. We have the SPI flash contents and the internal firmware. And so now, even if we unlock the processor, which will cause a mass erase, we can always go back to the original firmware. As you can see, this exploit is quite simple. And so we were really excited to be able to provide a relatively simple backup solution for other interested hardware hackers to use. Now, this is not yet ready for use by non-developers, but there are some projects in the works that will make putting homebrew onto the Game & Watch much more accessible. And I'm really looking forward to that. I hope you enjoyed this video. And if you're interested in supporting more work on the Game & Watch, please check out my Patreon. Thanks, and I hope to see you on this channel again soon.